Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Whitman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. This is your show, so uh, we try to uh, bring you information about items that you've asked us to talk about. And today we got returning stars. Uh, we have Dr. Eric Chenman, who is a urologist and uh, is a member of the Fowler, Yodel, and Chenman Urolo urology practice, and referring to the Fowler, Dr. Ron Fowler, who is a preeminent urologist in our community. And um, to open disclosure, very transparent, he's my urologist. So. But that's not why he's here. Uh, welcome, both of you. Dr. Thank Chen, you. welcome back. Dr. Farrell, welcome Thank back. Thank you very much. Good to have you. We've had a number of questions, and uh, you know, I, I, I just want people to know that we're going to talk about things that, uh, that they see on television all the time, and they uh, read about all the time, and uh, so uh, they, we've had some questions, so let's just talk about it. And uh, another, a, a good portion of which uh, relates to, uh, obviously, men's urologic and uh, I guess you can say uh, uh, intimacy uh, issues. Uh, so let's just talk about it. Dr. Fowler, you, uh, uh, as a senior member of the practice, uh, you've been around for a long time and uh, I, you've seen so much change with reference to uh, men's urologic uh, health, the advent of new diagnostic tests and things of that nature. So let's just start at the very beginning and let the folks know uh, what they should be doing, uh, particularly <coughs> the male population, with reference to seeing a urologist. Well, I think I would like to just take a step backwards from there and say, in general, men's health begins with maintaining good general health, a good healthy body, right. which means annual uh, examinations by their primary physician, uh, annual blood work or x-rays uh, as may be indicated or suggested by their general um, uh, or primary physician. Um, Dr. Chambin and I were talking about this earlier. If you take all the men that have prostate cancer and you say, what's going to kill them? What will they die of? The answer is not prostate cancer. The answer is heart disease or, uh, or cardiac vascular disease. So first and foremost, I think all men should be getting their general physicals, being seen by their primary physicians, and uh, getting that type of evaluation. Now, from the strictly urologic perspective, we recommend periodic, uh, usually annual, uh, PSAs and, dis and digital rectal examinations for uh, men over 50 and um, certainly for, for uh, gentlemen with a, uh, a predisposition to prostate cancer, those who have a family history and uh, that would also include African Americans where the risk of prostate cancer is greater, probably by 40 or 45 start the, with the digital examinations and the PSAs. Let me ask you a question just to explain what a PSA is and tell them, tell them what PSA stands for. Well, the PSA stands for prostate specific antigen and it's a, a test, it's a blood test that uh, can be easily performed uh, in your physician's office just by drawing a tube of blood uh, in, in some offices, the test is actually done there. We send ours out to a lab. And what it tells us, uh, it gives us an indication of the presence or absence of disease of one sort or another in the prostate. That could be either prostatitis, benign prostatic enlargement, or prostate cancer. And then hopefully it's left to our expertise to sort out uh, which uh, patients with elevated PSAs have uh, cancer and which have uh, other problems. And Dr. Chenman, I know that you were brought on, speci uh, not specifically, uh, only uh, for your urologic uh, knowledge, but also specifically because of the very unique uh, elements of uh, urologic surgery and otherwise that you're involved with. You want to talk to us about that? Uh, I think the the fellowship training, perhaps you're speaking about, yes. was in uh, 
endoscopic and laparoscopic urology. Explain to the people what endoscopic and laparoscopic is. Uh, very briefly, I think uh, endoscopic refers to anything that is done through a scope, a telescope, a flexible or rigid type of telescope as opposed to making an incision. So it's minimally invasive. Definitely minimally invasive, most minimally invasive. Uh, similar, we can address the urinary tract in a very similar way to the way a gastroenterologist commonly does a colonoscopy, which is just a different type of scope in a different part of the body. Right. And laparoscopic refers to working not only with the use of a telescope, but through small incisions, usually about the size of a dime or less, through in the, into the abdominal cavity and using long uh, chopstick-like types of instruments to do the surgery as opposed to operating through a larger incision with your hands. The most common procedure to date being the laparoscopic gallbladder removal, mm -hmm. and certainly today kidney, prostate, and many more. Okay. I, I wanted to get that out of the way because I know that, that that's been uh, specifically uh, an expertise which uh, you've, uh, or not that the practice had already been involved in it, but I know that that's what you, uh, your fellowship was. Let, let's talk about uh, the uh, issue. We, we, you touched on, uh, the last time you were here, it's just, uh, uh, BPH, uh, which uh, is, you can explain to people what BPH is, but uh, there was a lot of comment and a lot of requests for information about what do I do about BPH. So explain to the people what BPH is. Well, as Dr. Fowler uh, mentioned before, BPH is an acronym we use, stands for benign or not cancerous prostate hyperplasia or just simply enlargement. So as a man gets older, for the most, for the most part, as men get older, their prostate gets larger. And many of those men will start to have problems from that enlarged prostate. The main problem being difficulty urinating because the urethra runs right down the center of the prostate, much like a donut hole. Mm -hmm. And as the prostate grows, it grows outside, but it also grows inside, partially closing down that hole, making the tube tighter and more difficult for the bladder to squeeze the urine by. Mm -hmm. And how do, we, uh, how do we deal with that? If it, not surgically, are there products that one would take? I mean, I know people talk about using uh, uh, natural products, salt, palmetto, and things of that nature, but I believe there are other pharmaceuticals, am I not? Well, years ago, sir, the only option for a man with a large prostate, I think Dr. Fowler will attest to, it was open surgery. Mm -hmm. And then that had progressed probably somewhere in the 1940s and 50s to doing an endoscopic procedure, the, the TURP, or transurethral resection of the prostate, uh, what men often call the roto-rooter kind of job, coring out the inside of the prostate so that you leave the rind of the orange, so to speak, and remove all the pulp on the inside to open that channel wide open again so a man has a wide open channel to urinate through. And with the advent of newer medications, ones we commonly hear about, Flomax, Uroxitrol, Cardura, Hytrin, uh, to relax some of the muscles there, that's allowed us to get away from surgery, at least not as often, and with the addition of medications to help shrink the prostate, such as Avidart and Proscar, where you can use those either singly or in combination uh, if a man is either not interested or does not want surgery. I see. But there are, I think, more minimally invasive treatments now, ones that we do in the office even, such as microwave treatments or needle ablation treatments or laser treatments to basically heat up the prostate with some means of heat and to cause that enlarged compressing tissue to shrivel up so that the donut hole mm -hmm. opens up again. Sort of a go-between between, between the medications and more invasive surgery in the operating room. And I know that that's, you, you do that in your office on, I know on Broad Boulevard, I know you've done it. Correct. We, um, we've done quite a few of the microwave procedures. Um, there's several different companies that uh, have s instruments that uh, are, have been successful, and we've used, uh, we've, we've used two different types of microwave uh, machines with considerable success. Uh, it's an office procedure. It can be done with uh, a bit of oral sedation and some intravesical in, into the bladder. Uh, local anesthetic, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the procedures generally take between a half an hour and an hour. 
Uh, most of the patients tolerate it very well, and they do go home with a catheter for a week or so, and then over the next month or two, the prostate will shrink up from the effects of the heat. We also do a laser procedure in the office, the indigo laser, whereby a laser fiber is actually pushed into the prostate, again, using a local type or topical type anesthetic. We can push the laser fiber through the cystoscope into the prostate, step on the button, basically, which turns up the heat, the, an area of the prostate gets heated up, and that will eventually shrivel up and allow the passageway to, to open up mm -hmm. and permit freer urination. Uh, there are also hospital-only uh, laser treatments. The um, green light, for example, which is, has gained a lot of new popularity. But when it's all said and done, if somebody requires, if somebody has a much larger prostate in which we feel that one of these office procedures might not be warranted, then we get back to the old TURP, which has been tried and proven and is still the gold standard in somebody that, that requires a hospital procedure. Do you find, uh, <coughs> one of you, do you find a lot of people that uh, try natural products that come in and tell you that they were, you know, that uh, they're using these natural products and they're working, or are they not? I think a lot of patients will try some of the natural products, and I, I think there, there has been some, uh, certainly uh, a lot of patients have told me that they've done well with saw palmetto and there's been some literature to suggest that there is some benefit from it. Mm -hmm. um, but over and above that, I'm not sure that uh, many of the other natural products really have that much to offer with respect to BPH. What's Dr. Chairman? I, I would agree. Mm -hmm. There are some patients that have very mild symptoms that are perhaps a little afraid of going on a prescription medication, would rather get something, a, a men's health Mm -hmm. package, vitamin package that includes saw palmetto or saw palmetto on its own. There, I've definitely read studies that have uh, shown a benefit from it. I've definitely had patients that have told me they've gotten benefit from it. There's mm -hmm. actually uh, two studies out that have just come out in the last, I'd say, about three months that said saw palmetto clinically had zero benefit. But I think uh, to some degree we have to go by what the patients tell us. Okay, I want to talk about something that is every single night. I, I watch uh, the uh, news, uh, the 630 news, whether I'm watching NBC, ABC, or CBS. Uh, and every single night there are advertisements for issues relative to ED, otherwise known as erectile dis dysfunction. Can we talk about that for a while? Sure. Go ahead. Absolutely. It's all yours. I think what you see a lot of now is has been the big push since Viagra came out about six years ago or so. And then um, there's Cialis and what, what? Now the, the other competitors to that, the Cialis, the Levitra, uh, oral pills mm -hmm. that uh, very the simplest means of trying to take to fix a problem where in the past uh, therapy has been a little more obtrusive, a little more invasive. Any of the older pills that used to exist really didn't have good results at all. Uh, it's also obviated, I think, the ability to give a man a pill, as long as they're not taking any dangerous medications in conjunction, such as nitrates, nitroglycerin, mm -hmm. as long as they're not on those other medica that, that other medication or those medications at the same time, it can obviate a lot of the testing that we used to do complex ultrasound testing, even invasive uh, angiography testing to try and figure out the cause of the erectile dysfunction in the man. Simply that, uh, once you found out the cause, you still had to treat it. And if we can treat it with a pill and it works well with minimal side effects, then it makes, uh, it makes our diagnostic therapeutic plan a lot easier. Dr. Farrell? Well, I think, as Dr. Chenvin said, the advent of these newer medications has basically brought a problem out of the closet. It was mm -hmm. a problem most men didn't like to talk about and uh, they didn't even like to think about it. But once uh, these medications uh, were introduced and they've gained popularity and they've been promoted, um, you realize we, we've come to realize just how big a problem it is. And um, certainly uh, we have hundreds if not thousands of patients that, that use these medications, mostly with success. 
um, occasionally uh, not with success. And, and uh, uh, I would say prior to beginning any patient on a medication like this, we want to take some history and have a, try to get a fairly good idea of why they may have their erectile problem. Mm -hmm. And we also want to make sure that they, again, have had a cardiovascular evaluation uh, because, as I uh, alluded to earlier, erectile problems are not always but frequently a, a manifestation of vascular disease. Um, and vascular disease can exist in the genitals. It can also exist in the larger blood vessels and the heart. So anyone with, uh, with uh, erectile dysfunction should be getting a general physical and a evaluation of their cardiac vascular status uh, and a med medical evaluation. Diabetics can present with erectile issues. But once it's all said and done and the evaluations have been done and they've seen their primary physicians or cardiologists, the question of how we treat them, if there's no contraindic contraindication, usually the first thing we'll do is put them on Viagra or, or Levitra or Cialis, and most men will have a good response to that. The issue, again, is in my way of seeing things, when a patient comes in with this problem, it's not just put them on a pill, but again, there should be some evaluation and some recognition of, of the issues and the medical problems that can lead to erectile difficulties. Mm -hmm. That should be addressed and then put them on the pill. Well, I, I would assume, again, uh, the knowing that uh, in this very complex world of, uh, of health care where these people out here just can't figure out how they can get to certain doctors, I mean, I, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but you know, it, it's everybody is complaining. These folks out here complain to us all the time about how they can't get to see their, uh, their neurologist, their urologist, their pulmonologist, et cetera, et cetera, uh, because of the, the third party intermediary or otherwise doesn't allow you to, to get to see uh, your doctors unless they're, and probably rightfully so in many cases, unless they're seen by a primary care physician or the gatekeeper, but yet there is